whenever I get my hands on some information that people go, oh, you shouldn't get your hands on that, um, <laughs> I feel like I'm accidentally doing journalism, which I'm not sure if that's what I mean to be doing here. I'm aware that it is technically what I'm doing. Not necessarily the goal, for sure. I like more the analysis than the journalism part, but they sort of cross paths a lot. So I'm reasonably comfortable at this point diving in and used to diving into uh, asking questions of leagues and teams that, you know, pertain to things that are more journalistic and maybe investigative. Uh, but again, it's not really something that I love to do or am I, <laughs> or I'm overly passionate about. But that was what my week sort of became after a friend of mine who is better connected than I to some MLB channels was able to forward me an email that went to a lot of people, by the way. So it's it's kind of odd that it is a secret, it would seem. Um, but it went to a lot of people <laughs> and eventually found its way to me. And that email was about the MLB player acquisition process. It was sent from MLB to the clubs regarding the player acquisition process for players from partner leagues or from indie ball, specifically the big four indie ball leagues we talk about uh, that are the partner leagues. Um, there's a lot in it. We're going to break it down a little bit. I, I do want to start sort of back to basics because it's important to understand what the player acquisition process is uh, because the details mean nothing if you don't understand why and what. You know what I mean? So um, first of all, the player acquisition process is how MLB teams procure uh, – MO or indie ball talent when they like a guy in the partner leagues. Um, it's long been sort of a question mark how and uh, how exactly that goes. That's sort of, we kind of got how that went. Uh, the teams would be contacted and they'd work it out with an LMB organization. Um, but we didn't really know the finer points. We knew there was money exchange, but we were not sure how much. And that's important on a couple levels. It's important because, you know, it's good to know what kind of skin the game these teams have. But it's also good because players, you know, it's important to them. They're going, they all hope, you know, or a, a lot of them hope to be making the show or making it back to the show. So a key part of that step one would be getting back into an MLB organization. And with that, you know, if there's something that could stand in their way, like an exorbitant fee, then it's good to know. And a lot of the players uh, have only been told they've never seen paperwork on it. Uh, they've just been told something by a manager or baseball operations department uh, member. So it, it's fascinating, you know, to finally get some details on that. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, the balance is important when it comes to things like this. There's, there should be a balance that sort of benefits all parties. MLB gets a guy they want. They don't have to break the bank for him because if, you know, they had to pay too much, then they wouldn't be signing players and that's bad for players. And, you know, then that's a money stream that wouldn't be going to any ball team. So it's bad for them. If it was too cheap, well, I mean, that might be good for players, but also they might become overly disposable. Like it's kind of nice if, you're an indie ball guy and you know they paid a certain amount of money for you. Like they got some skin in the game. If you go 0 for 10 in your first 10 ABs, you know, you got to, not, they might not ditch you right off the bat. They might try to develop you a little bit more. That's a good thing. Um, and if you're also, uh, you know, putting the price too small, you know, it's not exactly going to help indie ball uh, teams. So it, it's a balancing act here. It, it can go wrong a lot of different ways. Uh, pricing too high, pricing too low, it can be a mess. Um, but these rules and policies on the whole have remained mostly secretive in the past. And all we've really known is a few basic facts, that there are rules. There are variations in these rules between the leagues. They change from time to time. And we've known that the partner leagues, the big four, as I said, have been becoming more uniform in many ways that we know the general nature of, but don't quite know the details of over the past year, couple of years like that. And by we, I do mean the fans, the analysts, hey, what's up, um, investigative journalists, question mark, uh, players, and many others uh, who, I mean, again, players don't know. <laughs> like, that's kind of weird. So when the players don't know, you know a lot of people don't know. So there's actually a small handful of people who do know within the partner league system. Though what I learned from the email is uh, there are a lot outside of that system that seem to know. But that's a different conversation entirely. So with all that out of the way. Let's jump on into a, I guess, like some sort of weird special edition of Indie Ball Nation. I think that's kind of what this is. That's how we'll play it. Um, yeah, man. The player acquisition special. Does that sound legit? Listen up, y'all. 
All right, before we hop into this thing, quick couple channel reminders. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, whatever else, at Indie Ball Nation. I'm not going to unplug that too aggressively. You can follow us on all major podcast channels too. Um, subscribe on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, the usual. Um, if you're following, it is, you're probably listening to this on a Monday morning or whenever. But if you're listening to this and it's new, that Monday morning, the 23rd, we're going to get a big transaction update because there have been a ton of deals made. And I was trying to like do all the investigative stuff associated with this project. So uh, I didn't get a chance to really do a full episode on it. So I'm going to do a bunch of transactions, probably like 20, 30 plus transactions tomorrow we're going to talk about. It. So if you're into that, keep an eye out because we are going to dive deep into some, talk some projections and all of that. Now, before we fully dive into the details of this email, this communication led me to ask several of the leagues some questions about the logistics of things. It seems that there are some legal restraints preventing the um, league and team officials from discussing these player acquisition details. So this is kind of how I knew, oh, okay, we're in some serious waters here. Um, But also, unfortunately, now I also know that there will be some conjecture here as we analyze what the different parts are uh, and what different things within this email might mean. Uh, we're going to kind of try to, we're, there are going to be some situations where you have to sort of rely on what we know of other things to contextualize and better understand what's going on in this email. The secrecy of it is fascinating because it's pretty evident that both MLB and the leagues don't necessarily want this info shared. In fact, it's very obvious they don't want this info shared. Um, but uh, it, it, again, conjecture, but they likely do feel it doesn't reflect well on them in certain ways. Uh, the indie leagues themselves are probably a little bit concerned that players would not um, be excited to find out how much money can be tied up in the acquisition process because, yeah, they might feel that it makes them less likely to be signed. And, you know, that's fair. That's up to them. Depends on the player. Uh, I think it is also important that, yeah, while a lot of MLB teams are cheap, they're also massively rich. So, you know, the money that we're going to be talking about is not a small amount of money. But at the same time, it's not a small amount of money in in that a lot of these things are more than what they pay a minor league player for an entire year, which is a different conversation. So there's that. But also, you know, they're throwing $400 million contracts around. So let's have some context here. So let's jump in. I'm going to just read some of this and we'll sort of step back and we'll take a look at what it means. The first paragraph opens with Major League Baseball, MLB, which feels like an unnecessary thing to specify, but it's okay continues to work with certain independent leagues to monitor and facilitate the orderly transfer of players from those leagues to major league clubs. In the event your club desires to acquire a player from the Atlantic League, American Association, Frontier League, or Pioneer League, collectively the partner leagues, it is necessary to use the email addresses associated with each partner league below. And it goes on to list them. I mean, first and foremost, it is pretty interesting and a little bit weird that the email goes to the leagues, but that may actually protect the player somewhat because at least the league knows that a uh, club is being contacted about a player and a club, if they wanted to, um, you know, can't just be shady and be like, whoa, we want to keep this guy. We're just going to play dumb. Um, I don't think that any teams uh, would not tell a player for the record, but I guess maybe it's just a fail safe in the process or all these different teams, all these different leagues, uh, all these different employees within the teams, you know, it might just be easier to and more consistent to have one league contact who kind of distributes from there. So I, I do see where they're going with that, but it is an interesting thing to see. Please note that the partner leagues are wholly, we're in the second paragraph now. I get that. I, I probably should have specified. Please note that the partner leagues are wholly independent from MLB and are thus under no obligation to permit major league clubs to acquire players from their respective leagues. MLB cannot and does not otherwise regulate the acquisition fees that these leagues may charge to permit a player to leave his contract with his team and sign a new one with a major league club. However, the partner leagues have informed MLB of the following acquisition fees associated with signing players from each respective league in 2022 and 2023. In the event that your club has any uncertainty about the cost involved with the player's acquisition prior to or after this notice, please contact our office. Okay. So we're about to get into it. Multiple things here, though. Partner league teams are, quote, under no obligation to permit major league clubs to acquire players. Okay, that makes sense. It sucks to hear. And again, I would hope that this isn't happening. Otherwise, what the hell are we doing here? Um, But it's also interesting to see that MLB pointing out that they cannot and they do not otherwise regulate the acquisition fees that these leagues may charge, which, um, interesting. 
because I have heard rumors, and here I'll say the rumor first, then we'll dig into is it legit that perhaps MLB has had some opinion or pushed in certain directions and even more the charging more direction, or at least charging more evenly between the leagues um, when it comes to this player acquisition stuff. It's my feel that that's probably not exactly what's going on. It's more MLB probably wants the leagues to be a little more uniform across the board, a little more consistent across the board. And I'm sure player acquisition fees are maybe wrapped up in that, but not necessarily pointed at. So we'll give them benefit of that out there. But it is interesting to note that all of these seem to be coming from the partner leagues, especially as you'll notice there are a lot of similarities between uh, at least the three of the big four here, uh, not counting the Pioneer League. So keep it in mind that I guess this is all coming from the partner leagues, but it's interesting to know. All right, now let's talk money. And I have been able to confirm the accuracy of this with some league sources in all of the leagues. So league sources, team sources, whatever. But these I have gotten some feedback about, whether I share or not, either here or there. I'm not going to name sources. We're just going to continue on. Now, last thing before we jump in, I do want to mention, like, it seems, you know, your heart wants to say that teams shouldn't be, you know, it should be free to sign a guy. But to be fair, these indie ball teams do put in money and effort and time to develop players and find these players. And again, these are players that MLB teams did have the opportunity to sign without an acquisition fee. And they passed on that opportunity where they released the player. And now here they are with an indie team and the MLB team wants them. So it's easy to say, well, it should be free. We want these guys to get to the show. But also, where does that leave the indie ball clubs? Because as you will see here, there is a good bit of money that can come in from that. And it can be a uh, a lot of additional ticket sales in a way just from getting one guy signed. So um, when you think about how hard you have to work to sell this amount of money in ticket sales, well, you realize how big a deal it is to the indie leagues and the teams in them that they get these fees. So hopping in, we'll start with the Atlantic League. The initial acquisition fee for the Atlantic League in the offseason, it's $2,500. And I'm, just, I'm not going to read word for word. It's just it, it's repetitive and wordy. Let's just simplify it here and talk about it for the rest of this. Uh, in the off season, it's twenty five hundred dollars before April or the day before MLB opening day, whichever is earlier. An additional twelve thousand five hundred is owed if the player remains with the MLB organization on MLB's opening day. In season, if you want to acquire a player, it's fifteen thousand dollars. All that at least makes sense. Um, you know, it's if you want a guy in season, it's fifteen thousand dollars. It's more because all of a sudden they have to replace one of their best players who you just took from them, and I follow that. Uh, when it comes to the offseason, it being $2,500 also makes sense when you realize that it will become the $15,000 that you know an in-season acquisition fee is if the player remains with the team in season. So, you know, again, the combined $2,500 initial uh, acquisition fee combined with the additional $12,500 if a player stays on the MLB opening day roster or stays on um, the MLB organizations and minor league rosters, whatever. Uh, on MLB opening day. Uh, and then again, in season, just going to be 15 grand flat. Now, it does get interesting where if a player from the Atlantic League makes it into the MLB roster for a uh, MLB organization that signs them, it's got to be the same one that signs them uh, from you know the initial indie ball club, then that indie ball team will receive $75,000 from the major league club. That's a lot. That's a lot of money. And, and you do wonder, you know, if that's in anybody's mind, I, I like to think it isn't, but you think about how cheap some teams are and you're like, couldn't you see a team being like, well, we don't want to pay the extra 75 grand to bring up this other guy for a cup of coffee. Maybe we'll bring up another instead. I like to think that's not the way it works, but you know, you know, there's players who are worried about it. So it's worth at least talking about if that's the case. Look at the American Association. It's very similar. The initial acquisition fee is $2,500 in the off season. Um, an additional $12,500 comes to the indie ball team if uh, you know the MLB organization still has the player come MLB opening day. And again, in-season acquisition fee is going to be $15,000. Major league roster fee is the same as the Atlantic League, that's $75,000. And that is, again, these similarities are not a coincidence. Uh, I, it's my feel that these leagues are working together to sort of be a little more uniform. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing. It's tough to tell. Um, Definitely take some power out of the player's hands to be able to go to the league that has, you know, maybe a lower acquisition fee. It's sort of, 
the monopoly is like way over dramatic, right? But you know, it's removing one additional variable that a player can use to, you know, leverage and put themselves in a better spot, I would say. But again, I'm not necessarily against these leagues making the money. I get it from both sides, but it's interesting to look at and interesting to see how much money is involved. And again, boy, $75,000 would be a lot of, you know, ticket sales you don't have to make if you were able to get a $75,000 little pickup because somebody, you know, within three years of being on your roster makes MLB organization's uh, roster. So moving on to the Frontier League. The initial acquisition fee, same as the American Association, same as the American, or same as the Atlantic, basically. The off-season acquisition fee again, twenty five hundred with the twelve thousand five hundred uh, if they stay on an MLB ro- or MLB organization roster on MLB opening day, plus the fifteen grand. We've been over that. Now the key difference with the Frontier League is there's only fifty thousand dollars coming their way uh, if the MLB club that acquires the player has that player on their MLB roster within three years of the acquisition. Uh, why it's different. I'm not exactly sure. I asked um, I asked around. I didn't really ask as much on that one. I asked more on the Pioneer League one. You'll see why in a second. But again, that was one of the dead ends we were hitting where I couldn't get feedback for legal reasons on that. So we'll just have to sort of imagine why that could be. But Frontier League, a little less of a kickback if your guy gets the MLB organization, which I have feelings on. Lastly, the Pioneer League. Initial acquisition fee is only $5,000 at any time off-season. So off-season or in-season. Um, I think it's interesting mainly because, okay, that's not the $15,000, but it is more in the off season. If they just check a guy out and bring him into the, you know, spring training. Um, so it is actually, you know, if you're in a Langley club and a guy gets brought in, but they, the MLB organization doesn't keep him to opening day, you only get $2,500. You actually get twice that if you're in the pioneer league. So that, that is fascinating is what I'm trying to say. Um, the major league roster fee, that's $15,000, only 15 compared to, the uh, 75 that we were looking at in both the Atlantic and American and the 50,000 in the frontier. That's the one that makes less sense to me because you're sure the pioneer league players are less developed, but also I feel like they're higher potential. Sure. Again, with that, they're younger guys. It's less likely they make an MLB roster within three years, but I, I asked the league, they said they couldn't respond. I understand that they're very kind to actually take the time to tell me that. Um, but it is, that is one, like I can wrap my brain around the acquisition fee in season varying, you know, um, maybe it's a little easier for certain leagues to find good competitive players. Um, and, you know, maybe if you're the Pioneer League, you're trying to get guys noticed in a market that also has Atlantic League players. So it's difficult. So the variety there makes sense. That's, I can wrap my head around it. Where I get confused is the Major League roster fee varying because once you're on an MLB roster, like major league roster, you're a major leaguer. Like we're not like this is a lesser player. He was obviously good enough to get one of the few spots on your roster. Why would a pioneer league player making a major league roster be worth less than an Atlantic league player in a way? That is weird, but that is why these roles are strange. And that's why it's important that we talk about them. Now, I'm not going to go much longer here, but I'm curious what people think about it. I wish I could get more feedback from the leagues. I understand why I can't. It's annoying. But it's also weird to think that a lot of the players don't know these things. And not just because, you know, it would be one thing if leagues were just not telling them. That's annoying in a way. But if they're, like, not allowed to know, I don't know if they are. I don't know if they're covered by the legal agreement. But it is definitely weird. We'll say it that way. We talked a little bit last episode about it. The struggle I run into of when there's a lack of communication, I start to wonder whether there's something shady going on. Based on the feedback I'm getting from people that I do respect within the industry, I don't think it's that. But I do think it's a touchy subject and they'd rather not discuss it. I think a lot of the way it's the way that your boss doesn't want to discuss salary with you in front of other people. Because then if you know what other people are making, they know what you're making, it becomes a headache for them. I think it's just simpler for all the leagues, including MLB to just have it behind closed doors and not talked about. Now that brings it to a video where I just put it all out there (laughs) and I get that. Um, And it's probably not super popular, but I think it's important that people know. And Hey, if it's going to be accessible to me, I want to share it with you guys. You're the type of people who are interested in the weird stuff I am. Um, I understand the tone of this episode was a little weird, (laughs) a little less bubbly and excited. I will be back on it 
uh, with tomorrow's episode. I know I'm more excited about it because we got some transactions. I was really excited about Todd Van Steen still got signed teaser. Um, so you can kind of look forward to the normal indie ball nation chaos energy, but I want to break this down in a way that at least hopefully made some sense. If, if it was a little tough to follow in a podcast form, check it out on YouTube because I was able to put up um, some of the the written, like the verbiage of it. Uh, so you can actually read along with it because I know that listening to, you know, not legalese, but the very structured, um, you know, formal email can be a little bit hard to follow sometimes. So I appreciate you bearing with me on that one. But I hope you picked up something here. I don't have much to add other than this. I just think it's fascinating. I think it's... Um, I guess there's a glimpse behind the curtain that we very rarely get. And I think it's exciting and I think it's informative and I think it's good to keep in mind in future, you know, maybe disagreements with players and organizations and to remember where uh, a lot of the income sources come from when it comes to the players, because uh, the, the, maybe the dirty little secret within indie ball is that teams don't often make money off of the players. Um, yes, they are the product on the field, but the amount of money you make, from good players and bad players actually does not vary that much, which I hate to say. Um, I'd say about 5% of the people in the building every night know the players on the field um, and know who's good and who's bad. Most of them are just there for the baseball game, you know, just the entertainment of it, not necessarily the the drama and the high, uh, the high scouting efforts that go into things. So really where they can make a lot of money the teams can from players is this player acquisition fee structure. So yeah, it's worth keeping in mind. I know it's not necessarily uh, the most exciting thing as I wrap up a weird Sunday evening show, which has me a little bit tired and I'm sure you can tell, but it's been a weird week, but I'm excited to be talking transactions tomorrow. And I'm excited to be always having y'all listen along with me. And I appreciate that as we continue through the off season, we are less than a hundred days away. We're at like 95 days, something like that, until opening day for the Atlantic League. So until tomorrow, y'all have a good one. I may not have a lot, but I love what I got. A four by four and a good fishing spot. I hope this time my card won't decline.